Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Jones, and welcome to the world's worst fishing. Um, today, uh, I guess you've already guessed it, uh, just given the title, we're gonna be doing an updated version of my most viewed video, uh, the complete guide to getting started making soft plastic fishing lures. Um, so I did this same sort of video about maybe eight or nine months ago, I'd have to go back and look. And um, the, the video did really well, it's my most popular video. And, uh, and it's one of my most substantive videos. And so I said, well, you know, I've learned a lot since then, I've evolved a lot, I've learned so much from, from some of my other peers. And I said, I think it's time to do this video again and we're going to update it. We're going to add some new information. We're going to talk about some new manufacturers, um, some new techniques, hopefully. And uh, I think it's going to be a really good video to reference because we have so many new people entering the space. Um, I get emails daily. Um, you know, hey, where should I buy this? Uh, what glitter do you recommend? Um, can you tell me about this mold? Or, um, you know, hey, what do you think of this plastisol? Or, um, and thank you for all those emails. Um, I'm happy to, to help in any way I can. So I said, well, we have so many new people coming in, so many new people trying it out. We're gonna do this video again and hopefully do it better than the first time. So cheers, prost. This is the Complete Guide to Plastics version two. Okay, let's do this. So first and foremost, everybody, soft plastic lures start with plastisol and you can see i already did not seal my bucket enough that is a small dead fly fail so this is what we're all working with right here it is a um it's basically a pvc compound uh, i don't know everything about uh, how plastisol is manufactured but it's uh, flexible pvc resin mixed with plasticizer and plasticizer can be found right in a bottle of worm oil uh, the label right there is a little worn off but we'll get to worm oil later and uh that's basically what we have here um it's a it's a it's a thick liquid it looks just like milk and this is what we're using um and before each use you want to stir your plastic and um you know depending on how much plastic you have um, you know, I've, I've bought it by the 55 gallon drum before, um, most commonly it's bought in a five gallon bucket. So, so five gallons at a time, um, you can buy a gallon at a time, even as small as like a quart, maybe a pint. Um, so for example, I'm just going to show you the most common way that Plastisol is used, um, at least at our level. In, in the home tackle craft community, and that's in a five gallon bucket. So I literally just have a kitchen spoon that I stole from my wife, and I just stir it up. Now, um, plastisol, because it has resin in it, the resin over time will sink to the bottom, okay? So if you're not regularly using uh, your plastisol, you at least need to stir every day, because that will prevent the resin from collecting at the bottom, and that's called hard packing. And when you have a lot of hard packing, if you think about it, all of your resin or a lot of your resin collects at the bottom, that's less resin in the rest of the plastic. So it actually throws off the blend of your plastisol. So if you had a medium plastisol and it hard packs and a lot of the resin goes to the bottom, you now pretty much have a medium soft um, because the more resin mixed uh, to the plasticizer, the more resin in the ratio, the firmer blend of plastisol you have. Um, so it's a good idea and I just like to stir it just like this. And depending on uh, what type of plastisol you use, some hard pack more than others, some don't hard pack at all. 
Um, my newfound favorite Plastisol um, comes from Dead On Plastics. It does not hard pack. Um, I have let it sit. So I let my five gallon bucket sit for two weeks once and I was using this stuff right here. This is by Lureworks. So I was not using my Dead On Plastics for a while and I came back and it didn't hard pack at all. I still had to stir it, but you know, not every Plastisol is gonna do that, but it's good practice to regularly stir your plastic and you don't wanna stir too fast because then you will introduce bubbles. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about some of the other components that you will need in order to make your soft plastic baits. Um, you know, we have all this stuff here and um, it's a little overwhelming at first. When I started, I had one single injector. I bought one three cavity injection mold, uh, one uh, five cavity open pour worm mold. I think I bought um, like two or three bottles of colorant this size, the four ounce, and <laughs> just a couple small containers of glitter. I mean, it was um, and, and then, well, and then five gallons of Plastisol. I mean, all in all, it was less than $500 um, was my initial investment into bait making. And uh, boy, does it grow quickly. So um, because it grows quickly, what do you need um, to, to get started? So basically, you're going to need a hand injector, okay? And this is one of the most important pieces of equipment right here. Um, it's basically a uh, machined aluminum syringe. It's a giant syringe, okay? And for any of you who do this yourself or have seen other of my videos, um, you know quite well how a hand injector works, but you have a nozzle tip and literally that's it. Um, you know, you have some rubber O-rings, which um, keep the plastisol from uh, obviously squirting out and that's what you'll need. Um, this particular hand injector is made by Bait Junkies. Um, I haven't seen it on his website in a while, um, so I'm not sure if he still makes them, but this is by far my favorite hand injector as far as a single injector goes, and uh, I wouldn't give it up for the world. Um, another piece of equipment you'll want to look at is, ta-da-da, you guessed it, a twin injector. This is basically just the double version of that. And what this allows you to do is shoot two color baits. Um, you've probably seen um, plastics before where you have one color on top, one color on the bottom. That's known as a laminate. This is how it's done. Um, what this does is this fits into a blending block, just like so. And if you look, it literally just takes both streams of plastic and funnels it, right? into one nozzle. So if I take this apart, here's what we have. Very, very, very simple and effective design. Color A, color B, they meet in the middle, and that's how you get those two color effects. Um, that is a standard blending block. Um, there also is a neat little tool called the C block. This is another blending block, but this makes swirl and sort of camouflage patterns um, which give your baits just a really, really awesome effect. Um, I'm sure, you know, you've seen swirl patterns before. Um, this is a good way to achieve that with hand injection right here. This is the funnest tool in the world to use. You never know what you're gonna get. It's like a box of chocolates. Um, so, and we can show a few examples of C-block baits as well. So, that kind of covers your standard injectors. Um, you will, however, encounter a triple injector, which has a third injector, and that makes obviously tricolor baits. So another thing you're gonna need is glitter. This is the most common size and shape. This, is, well, it's not necessarily the most common size, but this is hexagon shaped glitter, you'll see right there. And this is .035. This is known as the medium size, okay? Um, we also, Sorry, I gotta clear that off. 0 0.015, we also have a small size, okay? And that's known as just your standard small sizes. So there are some odd sizes out there, but generally the hierarchy is 0 0.015, 0 0.035, 
Then we have .062, which um, I don't actually have a small container that says it, but this is bigger size stuff you can see there. That's considered your normal large size, okay? Um, and then we have the really small stuff, the .008. This is like powder, okay? Um, I mean, it is, look at that, it's tiny. Um, smaller than a grain of sand, so. Um, those are your sizes of glitter. Now there's a couple different options. Um, standard high, high temperature polyester glitter is what most of your glitters are. However, there is such thing as hologram laser glitter. Look how pretty that is. This stuff is really, really, really cool. Um, I don't know if it says it on here, but this is sold as laser hologram glitter. Um, it comes in several other colors, not just lavender. Lavender is just my favorite. And this is a little bit different. It's not as uh, resistant to high temperatures, so you really have to be careful with that. Um, but you know, you can you can get almost an unlimited number of colors. Uh, here's some .035 hex. That's your medium stuff. And I mean, it just it never ends, guys. You can get so many cool glitters. I mean, the the stuff that we have available to us uh, is just incredible. When when I sit down and think about it, just the options that we have right here in our homes that, that we can do. Um, so, and then last but not least, I wanted to show you, you don't have to get hex flake. There's also the square cut. So if I pull out some of that, there are little squares. Um, Zoom Baits is, is uh, known for using square cut glitter. Almost all of their glitter is, is square cut. Um, hex cut just seems to be the most popular amongst the home tackle crafters. Okay, so next we have our actual colorants, right? How do I turn that plastisol into that green pumpkin, into that watermelon. So you're gonna wanna buy liquid pigment. And you have pigments, dyes, and then you have your powders and highlights. Um, so this right here is just standard watermelon pigment. Um, this is a 16 ounce bottle. Lure Works um, is probably the leader, I would say, in colors and pigments. As far as consistency, um, selection, and I think just overall just selection of the colors that you want. Not only do they have the most colors, but they have the colors that you want pre-mixed. You don't have to figure it out. Watermelon is watermelon. Green pumpkin is green pumpkin. June bug is June bug. You, you get the drift. Um, so this right here is, is what you'll probably start with is regular liquid pigment. And you can start by just um, doing drops. So that's, um, well, I'm about to get real messy here, but <laughs> that's kind of what it looks like. It's, it's just, it almost looks just like dye, um, except it's not. I gotta find my, uh, <laughs> you always want a little hand towel, by the way, because you will get messy. And uh, you, you wanna wipe your hands here instead of on your clothes. But um, pigments, pigments come, I mean, there, there's, there's as many of those as there are glitters. And there's several different manufacturers. Here we have MF Manufacturing which is really, really, really awesome stuff. I would put them absolutely a close second to Lure Works as far as quality and, um, and uh, I can't even think. And um, golly, selection, jeez, people. Uh, sorry, I worked all day, it's afternoon, a little bit tired. So anyway, um, you know, and, and as you can see, there are different sizes. You know, here we have, you know, a four ounce, this is probably, okay, so there's a two ounce. Dead On Plastics, my favorite brand of Plastisol. They have recently entered the colorant space, and let me tell you, some really cool stuff happening from here. Um, and so, you know, you're, I, I like to buy them in the 16 ounces, at least the colors that I'm gonna use a lot of. Um, but, for just starting out, these little sizes right here are such a good bargain. Uh, I mean, these are like six or eight dollars for four ounces, and believe me, you're gonna, it's gonna take a while to go through them. Okay, so perhaps I think the, the coolest part of coloring your plastic is with powders. Um, it's like the final frontier. There are so many things left to do with powders. Just the colors you can get are insane. And um, so here we have purple pearl powder. Now you have uh, glow powders, you know, for, for baits that glow in the dark. You have your standard pearls, which is what this is right here. Um, we also have just, just to show you real quick, um, just here's here's some red pearl powder. Um, whoop, hit the camera. And then one of the coolest tricks in the book is highlight. If you've ever looked at 
a bait where it was one color, but if you looked at it right in the light, it had a sheen. It, it almost had an outer sheen that was a different color. That's highlight powder. So if we look at this right here, you'll see it has a purple violet reflection, yet it's a white powder. It's not gonna discolor your bait. Whenever I add that to regular pigment, you know, it's not gonna change that from being watermelon, but it's gonna make it watermelon violet highlight. And that is how you can add some really, really cool effect to your baits that make them a little bit different uh, than you're gonna get in the packages on the shelves at your local tackle store. And um, there's just so many, so many inspiring combinations that you can get just using powders. And then the real fun begins when you start mixing powders and pigments. Um, like I said, guys, you have entered a world that just never runs out of cool ideas. Okay, so now let's let's go over molds. You'll obviously need molds. Um, you cannot make baits without molds. You know, you can have all the other stuff, but it's not gonna happen without a mold, obviously. So, we have a couple different things here. Um, now, by no means uh, am I a mold junkie. I don't have, you know, every type of mold that you can have in every shape, every different style. Um, but I'll show you what I do have. And really, you're only gonna wanna start out with just a few things. Um, so, the most common mold that, that people, that you'll see, are injection molds. Now you'll, if you look at this crawl bait right here, you have this opening, okay? That's called the runner. The top of it's called the sprue, okay? And then you have the gates, which are these little holes that enter the cavity, okay? So you have sprue, runner, gates, and then bait cavity. So whenever you take that injector, okay, and whenever you plunge that plastic into there, it's going to obviously funnel down and it's gonna push the plastisol all the way out the bait. Well, not out the bait, but it's gonna push the air out of the bait, which is then going to fill the cavity. So you can see how precisely these are machined. Uh, that's why injection molds and any CNC aluminum molds are so expensive. Um, you know, there's a lot of 3D CAD work that goes behind this, a lot of machine time. Um, you know, it's it's not simple. Um, so this is a pretty um, normal example of an injection mold. And you can see, I mean, it's, it's absolutely symmetrical. And the precision of the end product that you get from a CNC uh, milled mold is uh, second to none. So, um, and like I said, this is a two cavity. Uh, so once you put it together, okay, you have one craw bait on this side, one on that side. The molds are, however, are split in half. So whenever you use the blending block to do a laminate, you're gonna get color A on this side, color B on that side. And that's how, that's how they're top to bottom. So if I did green pumpkin and pearl, green pumpkin on this side, pearl on the bottom side. Or I could reverse it, however, it's, it's basically however you um, angle your blending block. So, for example, if I did it this way, color A is gonna fill this half, color B is gonna fill that half. So, um, that's your basic two cavity injection mold. Now, there are also injection molds with more cavities. So, here's a seven inch ribbon tail worm, okay? So we have our sprue opening, we have our runner, and then we have Two worms on this side, two worms on that side, and this is what a four cavity injection mold looks like, okay? That's a seven inch ribbon tail worm. Um, that one in particular came from Bass Tackle. Um, so I'll definitely put some links in the description, and I'll definitely put a graphic uh, or a list up on the screen of, uh, of some of the most common and best mold manufacturers. Um, so these two right here are from Bass Tackle. Here's a custom mold. I designed this bait myself and commissioned um, a mold manufacturer to make it for me. So this is my frog mold. It's a four cavity frog mold. Uh, you'll see here's the top part right here. Here's the bottom. That right there is the hook slot. So that little piece that sticks up, that provides the hook slot in the bait. Um, so you can buy the store-bought molds or you can fork out the cash for a custom mold, and custom molds can be very expensive. This one was a little over a thousand dollars by the time um, 
by the time it went from a pencil sketch on a napkin to this four cavity mold right here plus one other four cavity mold so eight cavities for a little over a thousand dollars you know it's it's not cheap now this is several years ago i think there's a couple new guys in the game that might be able to do it cheaper um again here's another two cav uh excuse me here's another injection mold this is a four cavity cinco worm pretty straightforward there a lot of people start out with a cinco mold um, it's a very easy mold to learn on it's an easy mold to learn laminates on and uh it's obviously one of the most popular baits of all time. Then you can get, you know, a little more intricate. Here is a beaver creature style bait. And uh, just the quality and machining on this is just incredible. This one right here comes from um, what I think is the uh, best mold manufacturer going right now, Angling AI. He's doing some incredible things and the finishing and the ease of which these molds shoot is uh, second to none that I have personally used. Um, haven't used them all, but I've used enough to know what a good mold is. Um, so I wanted to touch on another thing actually. These are all what's called single port injection molds. You have one port, a runner that feeds multiple cavities, okay? Um, that's what we've seen so far. Now, some baits are what they call top injection. So here's another custom mold of mine. This is my boom shad. It's a swim bait. You'll see each cavity has its own injection port. So you have, um, and a lot of times that's just because of the layout of the bait. Um, sometimes it has to be made that way. Um, this isn't as common as the other style, but I just wanted to show you that there are a couple different things that you'll encounter. Um, so don't be afraid of a top injection. Um, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Now. Um, I don't have a whole lot of open pour molds. I actually have a few more on the way. Um, and I'm trying to get a little more uh, um, experience with open pour. But the other half of the equation, you have injection molds and then you have open pour molds. These molds right here, you're literally gonna heat up your plastic in your Pyrex cup and you're just going to pour it in. And we'll do a quick gem demonstration of that as well. And this is where you have unlimited options. If you think about it, you know, in an in injection mold, I can only squeeze so many colors in there. Unless I want to mix up a bunch of colors, pour them into the injector, swirl them up, and then inject it, you know, I'm bound by the blending block, two colors, or the triple injector, three colors. Open pour, not so much. I can heat up 10 cups and do a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there, and just have a bait that comes out that, that just looks amazing, right? Just has all this different stuff in it. So these are open pour resin molds. This is made out of resin. Now there are open pour aluminum molds and then uh, silicone molds. So I actually do have an open pour silicone mold um, on the way. It's a custom swim bait that I'm gonna be introducing, that I'm gonna be selling. And I'm really excited to show you guys that. So, um, but just to get started, injection mold, maybe a couple open pour molds, and you'll find out real quick how much you love this stuff. Okay, so I've kind of cleared the deck a little bit here and I've left just a few things for a quick demonstration. So we've gone over what Plastisol is. Um, we've gone over how to maintain your Plastisol. And one thing I did not touch on, I, I kind of touched on it right at the beginning, but anytime you use your Plastisol, you want to seal your bucket or your container or your drum, whatever you're using, seal it back after each use. You want to prevent moisture from getting into your plastic that will cause bubbles, and bubbles are a big problem, but you can solve them, and I'll show you how. But before I do that, um, you know, I, I wanted to just kind of quickly say, how do we take all of this crap, right? All of this stuff, and turn it into beautiful, modern, soft plastics by today's standards. And um, here's how you do it. So what I did is I measured out a Pyrex cup and you want a microwavable Pyrex cup and I measured out to the one cup line okay so I think one of the best ways to get started is to learn good habits when it comes to measuring out your formulas and just kind of learning how to create good colors eventually you'll get to where um, you know you'll, you'll explore a lot and you won't be as strict um, you know and unless you're selling of course, but um, 
I think, I think a good starting point is to learn formulas and to learn how to develop formulas. And the way that I did it was I did it by the one cup. And so I know, hey, my June bug is one cup of plastisol and 40 drops of black grape or June bug or whatever my base color is. So for today's demonstration, I actually have to match a custom color uh, for an order. So we were gonna do that real quick. So I have one cup and I need to make an old Zoom color called pumpkin green. It's not green pumpkin, but it's a pumpkin color, which is a light brown, and it has black flake and green flake, okay? So, Carolina pumpkin is my favorite shade of brown. So I have one measuring cup. I'm gonna start with 30 drops, okay? So here's two, three, four, five, six, seven. We can count. Mm -hmm. Like watching paint dry, huh? All right, well, I officially lost count because I started thinking about how I have to go pick up uh, Landon here in a minute, but that's probably pretty close to 30 drops. <laughs> Great demonstration, guys. Yeah, make sure that you do your formulas right and then forgets how many drops he has. Okay, so that's what we're gonna start with, okay? Now what we're gonna do is we're going to stir in the colorant, okay? Now you can buy stirring rods. I just use cheap um, butter knives. You know, I just went to Walmart and you can pick up a little pack of butter knives. It really doesn't cost anything. So I'm gonna stir that in nice and slow, okay? And there's what we have. Now, the next step that I like to use is heat stabilizer. Some plastisols don't burn as easy as others, but you can overheat this stuff to the point to where it will actually become toxic and you don't wanna breathe it in. You don't wanna breathe it in regardless, but you can actually overheat it to where it will degrade the resin and it will start turning colors. It will not look good anymore. You'll know when you've burnt your plastic. What can help prevent that is heat stabilizer. So this particular plastisol right here, it's by Lureworks, it's their Porosol. I know that I wanna add some heat stabilizer to it before I cook it, just to prevent it. You know, once you've burned it, it's too late. You can add heat stabilizer to it all day, but you're not gonna get it to look as good again. Okay, so I'm gonna stir that in. All right, now, here's where you have a couple of options. You can put this straight in the microwave, okay? And if you have not over stirred, if you do not have moisture in it, then you're gonna have minimal bubbles. A lot of plastisol has a lot of bubbles in it, okay? Now, what I like to do is I like to use a vacuum chamber to go ahead and suck all of the air out of this plastisol. That way, whenever I cook it, I don't get a cup full of bubbles, okay? And this isn't a necessary step to get started because they are rather expensive. A uh, vacuum chamber, I think, can be bought for about 160 bucks. Uh, check out baitplastics.com, they have a good one. Um, but this is just something that I like to do. I didn't do this when I got started, but I quickly uh, invested into a vacuum chamber, so we're gonna go ahead and head over there. Okay, so this is my vacuum chamber. It has a single stage vacuum pump, obviously an air hose, and then you have a pot with an acrylic lid that seals. So basically the whole concept behind this is to put your cup of plastisol in there, put your lid on, and uh, I'm sure each vacuum chamber is a little bit different, but you want to close your burp valve, you want to turn your valve on, and then you turn on the pump. And what that does is that will suck all of the air out of this chamber, and by default, it will remove the air from the plastisol. And these are measured in inches of mercury, and it goes backwards. So we're gonna start at zero, and we want it to get all the way down to negative 30. And I like to leave it in there for a couple extra minutes just to make sure. So we're gonna go ahead and cut this on. And you'll see the needle starts to move. Okay, so real quick, before you ever pop your Plastisol into the microwave, before you cook your Plastisol, you want to make sure that you have something in place for ventilation. Now, if you are shooting plastics in a enclosed environment, you're gonna to wanna to wear a good respirator mask, okay? Um, you don't wanna play around with this stuff, especially if you're doing it often. Um, myself, I make all my baits in my garage at my house. So what I've done is my setup is kinda of in line. It's along a wall. 
So I have a box fan that blows air. Sorry, I'm trying to get the camera right. That blows air from the vacuum chamber because the pump actually produces um, gas, fumes, whatever. And so it draws it in through the back. It pushes it out, okay? And then all of my fumes go out this fan, which then go out side, okay? So, um, you know, you, you want to make sure that you're not breathing this stuff in, that you're not having fumes go directly to your face. If you want to learn more about Plastisol and breathing it in, um, contact your Plastisol manufacturer and ask for a material safety data sheet. And uh, that will tell you all you need to know. Okay, so the microwave is obviously your friend. Um, so this is just a cheapie from Walmart. I mean, this is nothing special, people. This is a 900 watt absolute just bargain bin microwave. And it's been cooking plastic for me for years, okay? So I know that with my 900 watt microwave, that if I put one measuring cup of Plastisol in, three minutes, cooks it pretty much perfectly. It's cooked all the way through. It'll reach 350 degrees. It will complete the gel process, but it's usually not burned. Um, and it's not scorched, and the color is still nice and rich. When you get your plastic too hot, you'll see the color start to fade. It, it kind of degrades with the plastic. Um, some people like to only heat in minute intervals. They'll heat up one minute at a time and stir each minute. Um, that's a good habit uh, because it really, really reduces the chances of overheating. Um, you know, I just, there again, time is really valuable. I know that three minutes has never done me wrong and uh, that's what I choose to do. And another thing real quick, um, while the microwave is cooking, um, you'll also want to invest in some clamps. Now, there are two types of clamps. We have these little hand clamps, and this is for when I'm just do maybe doing one mold at a time. You know, boom, I'm, I'm good to go here. Or I would do it this way, um, or I would just add more clamps. Um, these are just a cheap way to quickly clamp a mold if you're just making something real quick. However, let's say, let's say I had five of these stacked up. I would use this style clamp right here I could then clamp all five together, and then I could do one up here and one in the back and clamp them all together. Um, you know, these you can pick up at Home Depot or Lowe's, and this is the most common thing, because chances are you're not just doing one mold at a time. You've got several lined up, and uh, this is the best way to clamp your molds together, because you definitely want to clamp them firm. If not, the Plastisol will actually kind of go in between the cracks and you wind up with baits that look like they have wings on them, and that's called flashing. You do not want flashing. So um, there's a couple different options for clamps. Just for this demonstration, we're gonna be using these, and those will suffice just fine. Okay, so there's what cooked Plastisol look like. You'll see it's smoking, right? That's why ventilation is important. So you'll see that when it smokes, the smoke's going that away, and um, and that's what I want to see. So this particular customer, he wanted salt in this bait. And, uh, and this brings me to another point, salt, okay? So a lot of your plastics have salt in them. I mean, just look at a Zoom bait, look at the Gary Yamamoto Cinco. What salt is, is basically it adds weight, density, so you can maybe cast the bait a little better, but most importantly, it makes it sink, okay? but it also makes the bait weaker and it tears up easier. I don't personally believe this has anything to do with getting bites or the fish holding onto the bait longer. I think that's unfounded, but however, what I do know is that salt adds weight and it makes the bait sink. So that's why Cinco's always have salt in them. Um, to me, putting salt in a frog makes no sense whatsoever. I don't really want my frog to sink. Uh, it's a topwater frog, so anyway, um, salt is um, a little tricky to use because it will sink in the plastic so you have to constantly be stirring your plastic but that's just one of the prices that you pay um, so I use a quarter of a measuring cup okay so a full measuring cup this is a quarter of that now I use a full scoop of this per one cup for a Cinco because I want those to have a lot of salt however 
These are gonna be trick worms. So I'm gonna use about half of that. Just enough to add some density and salt actually changes the hue of the color a little bit. So just like making grits here in the south, you wanna stir and pour slowly. That way it doesn't clump up, okay? So that's how we're gonna do it right there. And we're just gonna stir slowly, 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 okay? Just to make sure that it doesn't clump up too bad. And I don't know if you can tell, but it has actually brightened. It lightens the color a little bit, okay? Whoop, kick the camera. So, another thing you're gonna wanna invest in are little spoons of some kind. So here's a quarter of a teaspoon. And um, I use this, and then I use an, uh, a half of a teaspoon. And those are what I stir, and those are what I use to scoop out my flake and my powders, just depending on whatever I'm using. So this color, I need ah, medium-sized black flake. So again, the medium is the .035, okay? And for a measuring cup worth of salted plastic with 30 drops in it, okay, one scoop is, is pretty decent, okay? So, so let's stir that in. Let's go ahead and stir that in. And you'll see that the black flake is now readily visible, okay? I might add just a little bit more for good measure. Okay, so that right there is straight pumpkin color. That is, that is traditional pumpkin. It's light brown with, with medium black flake. This one, however, the customer wanted me to add some green to it, which, um, which is what the zoom color was, the, green, the pumpkin green zoom. So I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna do a full scoop of the green medium. Then I'm gonna add a little more, okay? So both glitters have about the same ratio. I, I have the same ratio for, the, for both the black and the green. So that's what we have. Beautiful, okay? So you can see that this is now a lot thicker. It's starting to set up. So what I need to do is I need to put that back in the microwave, okay? But you don't wanna reheat too fast because then you can scorch it. So I'm gonna probably put that in for another 35 seconds and you just kinda keep going in small intervals till it's right. Okay, so I have this heated back up, all right? So you can see it's, uh, it's much more uh, fluid now and uh, it's smoking again, so 340 degrees. You'll obviously want a little laser temperature gun. Pick that up at Walmart or your local hardware store. So, now we're gonna take our big metal syringe, okay? We're gonna stick the tip down in the plastic and we're gonna pull it up, okay? Now we're gonna just insert it there into the opening, into the sprue. And we're gonna push down nice. I don't, I don't know if you can see uh, this part, but we're pushing this part down. Mm. We'll try and see what we're doing there, okay? And then you'll feel it stop. Once it stops, it's done. I'm gonna hold pressure for a little bit, okay? And then I'm gonna take it out. And then I'm always gonna squirt a little more on top of the sprue, and that's called topping off the sprue. And the reason you do that is because as the plastic cools down, it shrinks and it will draw in. And if you don't have enough plastic in the runner, you can sometimes have problems with the baits. So that's what we have right there. Okay, so our mold is set up. You'll see right there, um, everything's, everything's already good and set up. That's uh, already basically just lukewarm. And there's a couple different um, trains of thought on when you remove the baits from the mold. So here we, here we have the trick worms right here, okay? So we're just gonna go ahead and pop them right on off the sprue, okay? And there's what, there's what we have. Looks good so far. Now, some guys like to dip them in water, okay? Cold water. And keep in mind, you'll see how those sink immediately. That's because they have salt. Now, it's not a good idea to let salted baits sit in this water to cure for a long time because the water uh, with the salt will actually um, hurt the baits a little bit. The salt will kind of, the, the baits will expand. If you've ever had your tackle box get wet, you know that your Cinco's don't look so good after they've been wet for a day. But this right here 
allowing them to get kind of thermal shocked in cold water um, helps kind of kickstart the curing process. And the reason why you want to pay attention to curing is because these baits, although they're done, they're not quite done. If I was to let this bait sit like that all night, it would permanently be kinked like that. So I need to lay it out flat, okay? So um, I'm just gonna use this mold, for example. If I were just gonna lay these out without carrying them in water, okay? I'm just gonna lay them out nice and straight like that. Now I can just do that. I can let them sit like that for the next 24 hours. That's how I let my baits cure. I don't really do the water. I just wanted to show it on film. A lot of guys choose water, okay? And you wanna make it cold water. That way it kinda of shocks them and starts the, and kinda of kickstarts the curing process. Then you still wanna go ahead and lay them out. Now some people like to hang their baits, okay? So they'll have a rack or something like that, okay? And to where it will actually hang the baits. That way they hang straight, that way they dry straight. So the rule of thumb is cure them straight and then they'll look nice and straight packaged in the bags when you send them out to your customers. Or if you're just making them for personal use, you know, if I think about a creature bait, I don't want the tails and the appendages to be all kinked, even for personal use. So. You want to lay them out straight and allow them to sit for at least 24 hours before uh, putting them in bags or putting them to use. Um, it takes about 24 hours for them to completely cure up. Then after that, have fun. Okay, so now that we've looked at um, a basic example of how to do hand injection, now we're gonna look at an example of doing an open hand pour. So uh, stay tuned. I know this video has been really long so far. Um, we're almost done. I just wanted to get a quick demonstration of um, just kind of what hand pouring looks like and uh, so that you can just see if that's something that you're interested in. And uh, we're gonna dive into that right now. Okay, so I'm gonna use this uh, six inch open resin pour mold. This is a uh, ribbed swim bait. And we're just gonna do a two color laminate. So, um, you obviously wanna pour the bottom color first. So we're just gonna pour this white pearl in. And I'm having to do this kind of around the camera. Um, so it may not uh, may not look all that pretty. Little, little wobbly hands here, but that's okay. So we wanna pour that part in first. Let that sit. You know, shake it up a little bit to you know, work out some air pockets uh, that there might be. Okay. And uh, you want to let that color, that first color, sit a minute um, to let it kind of barely set up, so to speak. In fact, I want to put a little more in the tail. All right. And don't worry, you're gonna have spillover. That's part of the game. Part, just part of the game. There's nothing you can do. All right. So we're just gonna let that kind of sit. You'll see it's still pretty. Pretty uh, liquidy, gonna let that fill in some of the ribbed gaps there. Okay, and now we're gonna go with our top color. <clears throat> All right. This is like a uh, green aqua pearl that I mixed up. Sorry, this is really hard to do this around the camera, but I want the camera to be in the center of the frame. All right, so there's what we have. And that looks a hot mess, but you trim it up later and it just somehow works out. Um, so that should give us uh, some sort of a laminate effect. And uh, if you just want like a random swirl, then you just kind of take both and you just kind of pour them in together uh, at random. And um, you can get some really fun things that way. So we're gonna let this sit for a minute. Now that's a pretty thick bait. This probably needs to sit for six or seven minutes. Um, so we'll meet you back then and we'll pull it out and see what we have. All right, so we're gonna attempt to go ahead and pull this bad boy out. Okay. All right, so that's what we have right there. You can kind of see the top, the top and bottom colors. Now we're gonna trim it up and we're just gonna take some small scissors and trim that up and then I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, so. Here's what we have. This is just, that's just a basic laminate. 
in an open pour mold. And um, you know, to finish this off, I would attach eyes, and then I would clear dip this bait, which means I would take a cup of Plastisol with no colorant in it, just regular clear Plastisol, and then I would dip the bait in it, and it makes like a nice, shiny, glossy effect, sort of like the top. You'll see the top is shiny, but the part that was actually in the resin is a little dulled from the resin. You would clear dip this, and, uh, and that would really, really make this shine. Um, so anyway, just wanted to uh, show you a quick example of hand pouring. Well, okay everybody, thank you so much for tuning into this video today. Um, thanks for watching all however long. It's gonna be 40 something minutes, I'm sure, by the end of it. Um, I don't really know yet, because I haven't made the video. But um, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope this video has helped. I hope it has kind of taken you from, um, you know, maybe total beginner to now the confidence to get started if that's what you want to do. Um, so hopefully this video has um, has definitely, uh, well hopefully it has achieved um, my goal which is to um, kind of take you from start to finish to get this, you know, this is what it's all about. Um, now obviously I sell bait so I have, um, you know, packaged lures but that's what we're trying to get to is a finished product whether it's for yourself for you and your buddies or maybe as a side business or a full-time business so anyway that's gonna wrap it up this video has been long enough thank you guys so much for watching please shoot me a bunch of comments down below you can email me questions or email me comments worldsworstfishing at gmail.com and I hope to hear from each and every one of you so have a great weekend everybody well actually it's the weekend now so this video is probably going to go up during the week have a good week everybody and uh hopefully i'll see you on the next episode and uh thanks again for watching